بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه ومن اتبعهم بالإحسان إلى يوم الدين رب الشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل الأقدة من لساني يفقه قولي اللهم انفعنا بما علمتنا وعلمنا ما ينفعنا وزدنا علما سبحانك لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته First I want to apologize for being late a little late I just came back from Milan China this afternoon to get a better feeling of what it's like to be a minority you know you get the best feeling of being a minority in a country with 1.3 billion population and uh, you are like a tiny fraction being a Muslim. Uh, oh, let's start by praise and thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for having created us, guided us, and uh, having gathered us here tonight to pursue His pleasure and to be spiritually re refreshed and to remind each other of our purpose of life and how to live our life. And uh, we ask Allah to send his peace and salutations upon his final messenger Muhammad, his entire household and all his companions and all those who follow them. And uh, again, I want to thank the organizers of this event uh, for providing this platform for us and for inviting me again, although we have much more knowledgeable people here in the audience. You know, many brothers from HKU, they're uh, very supportive, but although they are much more knowledgeable than me, they still give me the chance to share as little knowledge as I have. So uh, may Allah make the time we're going to spend together tonight beneficial to all of us. I mean, so today's topic, being a minority, I think is very relevant to all of us here in Hong Kong because it doesn't matter if you are born and raised in Hong Kong or you are from another country. It doesn't matter if you're from a Muslim country or a non-Muslim country. It doesn't matter if you're a student or uh, someone who's working. We are all, as a faith community, a minority in Hong Kong. We as Muslims are a minority in Hong Kong. And according to the 2016 consensus by the Hong Kong Government Home Affairs Bureau, as you can see here, Hong Kong has about 300,000 Muslims, of whom 50,000 are Chinese, 150,000 are Indonesians, and 30,000 are Pakistanis. Let's just stop there. People are shocked already, right? So the, status, uh, the, the data says that there are more Chinese Muslims in Hong Kong than Pakistani Muslims. I was shocked when I read that too. So that means there are many hidden Chinese Muslims that we need to discover. <laughs> um, and today actually I, I see more uh, Chinese Muslim sisters and brothers in the audience, which is, uh, very, which is a very pleasant uh, thing. So the rest of them are from other parts of the world, including the Middle Eastern countries. So it, it appears that the Hong Kong government has trouble differentiating people from the Middle Eastern countries. So that's just a general term to describe them, the Middle Eastern countries. And um, what is the population of Hong Kong? Anyone knows? Seven million. Yeah, it, it's more than 7 million, actually. It's uh, about 7.3 million. And if we do a simple division, we, we divide the 300,000 Muslims by uh, the total population, about 7.3 uh, million, we get the percentage, which is 4.08. So we as a faith community in Hong Kong, we as Muslims, uh, take up about 4.1% of the whole population. And it is indeed a very, very tiny fraction. So it means in every 100 people, only four of them are Muslims. But interestingly, if you compare this number to some other countries and societies, you would find that this percentage is very close to the UK, much more than the United States, significantly more than Canada. But all these societies, all of us know that they have very active and vigorous Muslim communities. They're doing a lot for Islam and they have established their presence in these societies. They have, you know, annual conferences. Uh, they have a lot of um, institutes uh, for Islamic education. So that means in terms of number, we are actually not uh, at a disadvantage comparing to these countries. And that also means there's much more room for us as Muslims in Hong Kong to improve ourselves, to work harder, to, to uh, do more uh, in order to establish our presence in Hong Kong, in order to be acknowledged, to be recognized, and to uh, make a contribution uh, within our capacity in this society in which we are a minority. So there's much more we can do. Um, before we go into the topic of 
how to be a minority. What does it mean to be a minority? What are the things that we need to do as a minority? I want to uh, show you a very short video, about five minutes, less than five minutes. It's a theory in uh, psychology called conformity theory. Um, well, I think, I don't know if this is loud enough, but uh, I'll just play it. And uh, today I want to keep this sharing more in, uh, you know, interactive. I may want to have a, have a conversation with you about this video afterward. So please uh, you know, watch it tentatively, attentively. Experiment is not a public opinion poll. It examines behavior under the pressure of social forces as the experiment of Solomon Ash reveals. The experiment you'll be taking part in today involves the conception of lengths of lines. As you can see here, I have a number of cards, and on each card there are several lines. Your task is a very simple one. You're to look at the line on the left and determine which of the three lines on the right is equal to it in length. All right, we'll proceed in this order. You'll give your answer. Only one of the people in the group is a real subject, a fifth person with a white t-shirt. The others are confederates of the experimenter and have been told to give wrong answers on some of the trials. The experiment begins uneventfully as subjects give their judgments. Two, 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 three, 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 three. But on the third trial, something happens. Two, two, two. Two. Uh, two. The subject denies the evidence of his own eyes and yields to group influence. What? Ash found subjects went along with the group on 37% of the critical trials. But he found through interviews that they went along with the group for different reasons. What? One. They must be right. There are four of them and one of me. Uh, one. This subject's yielding is based on a distortion of his judgment. He genuinely believes that the group is correct. One. 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 Two. One. Two. 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 I know they're wrong, but what should I make waves? Two. In this case, the subject knows he is right, but goes along to avoid the discomfort of disagreeing with the group. Here, the distortion is at the level of his response. Two. 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 In the previous experiment, the naive subject stood alone against the group. In this variation, Ash gave the naive subject a partner, here seated in the third position, who also gives the correct response. One. One, two, one, two. With a partner, yielding drops to only 5% of the critical trials compared to 37% without a partner. Although subjects report warmth and good feeling toward the partner, they typically deny that he played a role in their own independence. The partnership variation shows that much of the power of the group came not merely from its numbers, but from the unanimity of its opposition. When that unanimity is punctured, the group's power is greatly reduced. Sometimes we go along with a group because what they say convinces us they are right. This is called informational conformity. But sometimes we conform because we are apprehensive that the group will disapprove if we are deviant. This is called normative conformity. The strength of the normative factor is shown in another variation carried out by Ash. In this variation, the subject is told that because he had arrived late, he would have to write his answers. Subjects in this private response experiment are exposed to the same amount of misleading information as other subjects, but they are immune from any possible criticism by the group. One. 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 And this enormously reduces the pressure to conform. Conformity drops by two-thirds. Ash's experiment is a classic. It reveals how people will deny what they see and submit to group pressure. It allows us not only to observe conformity, but to study the conditions that increase or reduce its occurrence. Yeah. Okay, uh, that's the experiment about conformity theory. And I hope you paid 37% um, of attention to this video. So we're going to have a short summary of this uh, on the whiteboard.
Um, basically, there are mentioned in the video there are two kinds of conformity. Anyone remembers the names, the terms for two, two kinds of conformity? There's informational conformity and normative conformity. Very good. <laughs> I'm not a teacher. <laughs> so I, I just write info and uh, normative. So there are two kinds of conformity. Info, uh, informational conformity means that one literally confuses because of the unanimity of another response. Everybody else says A is the correct answer. Although the evidence suggests that B is the correct answer, there are so many of them, they're just one of me. So I honestly believe that they are right. Although the evidence suggests that I'm right, but I believe they are right. This is infor informational conformity. Normative, uh, normative conformity, on the other hand, suggests that I know I am right, but I don't want to be different. I don't want to be strange. I want to be accepted. I want to be a part of the group. And that's why even though I know A is right, but all of them are saying B is right, I'll say B is right, just to be accepted. So how is this theory going to be manifested in our context as Muslims? You would find this is actually very applicable to us as a faith community. So informational conformity can be applied to us as Muslims. For example, uh, it means that when we actually don't know whether we are right or not, right? When the media keeps telling you again and again that Islam is a problematic religion, that it's backward, incompatible to the modern civilization, that it's backward, that it limits human rights, that it's oppressive to women, all kinds of accusations, and these are played over and over and over again. So even if you are raised from a very good uh, Muslim background, you start doubting. So, so informational conformity to Muslims, uh, it leads to doubts. Right? Am I right or are they right? Because there are so many of them. There's just one of me. And there are so many in a society that says homosexuality is only a genetic, you know, it's, a, it's a normal thing. It happens in every animal species and it has been happening over the human history. So why is it strange? And you start doubting. Maybe they're right. right? Maybe there is something wrong about the Quran. So that's what informational conformity leads to. And, and when we talk about conformity, we're talking about being a minority. Right? They have more... Uh, uh, the opinion that the other opinion has more followers and our opinion has less. So normative conformity, another example, uh, an example of normative con conformity can be, I know I'm right and I know what I'm doing is right. I know what I'm believing is right, but I don't want to be different. I want to be accepted by the society. So I'm at the airport and the awesome time comes and I have a bunch of friends, you know, we're talking, we're having fun. I know I need to pray and I want to pray actually. I'm a good Muslim. I'm a practicing Muslim. I want to pray, but then Oh, come on, this is an airport. Everybody's looking. They're going to think I'm a terrorist. <laughs> Especially we, we, if you have a big beard. It's, it's, it's a peer pressure, right? You're like, I, I really want to pray and it's bothering me, but I don't want to be, I don't want to stand out. I don't want other people to feel any suspicion of me. And that kind of conformity makes you refrain from doing something right or doing something you want to do because you want to be accepted. And I would say that normative conformity is more common in our daily life. And there are many more uh, examples and you can think of. So normative conformity, instead of doubts, it uh, basically punch punctures your determination. You're not as determined to do the things you need to do anymore. So I will call this domination. You're dominated. Dominated by the public opinion, by the public perspective, by the consensus of the society to not do the right things, to not say the right things, to not uh, believe uh, as you would believe. So, um, of course, these are challenges and obstacles for us as Muslims. We, we don't want to have doubts. We want to, be, we want to be firm. We want to have yaqeen. And we don't, have, we don't want to be dominated. We want to be determined. We want to do things despite other people's opinion. But it's hard, right? This is human psychology. And interestingly, in Arabic, psychology is called ilmu nafs, the study of the nafs. So it's part of your nature, it's part of your being, it's part of yourself, it's part of how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us. You cannot go against that nature. Uh, well, you cannot go against that nature under normal circumstances, but you can. You will be powerful enough to go against that nature and to fight it and to win over it if you have some weapons, if you have some uh, tools, if you have some reinforcement. What is that reinforcement? Where do Muslims go when they want reinforcement in their deen? They go to the Quran and the Sunnah. 
So we go to the Quran and the Sunnah and let's see what kind of advice does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Prophet وسلم, give us in order to strive against doubts and domination, in order to fight against informational conformity and normative conformity, although of course those are not mentioned in the Quran, but the idea is there. So let's see how we can win over this uh, human psychology. Let's go to the Quran first and let's use the methodology of content analysis. It's very simple. We want to learn about what Allah talks about minority. Let's just search for the word minority. Let's just search for qalil, little, few. Let's just fo And you would be shocked at how many verses there are about this topic. Some of them are quite long, so I'll you know try to make it uh, I'll ma try to make it short. So Allah says uh, he made a covenant, uh, a contract with Bani Israel. Uh, Bani Israel. With Akhazna Mithaka Bani Israel, La Tabuduna illallah, Wabil Walidain Ihsana, Wadil Kurba, Waliatama, Wal Masakin, Wakululin Nasi Husna, Wakim Musala, Wa to Zaka. So basically, Allah gave them the, in the uh, Jewish tradition, the Ten Commandments, things that you should do, things that you shouldn't do. Simple as that. It's just a, a contract, you can say, between Bani Israel and Allah. But the result is very simple. Thumma tawallaytum. And thumma indicates a, a long period. After a long period, you turned back. You turned away from this covenant. You refrained from the commandments and you indulged in the prohibitions. Illa qalilan minkum. Except a few of you. Except a minority of you. Wa antum And the, the rest of you, the majority of you are, you know, refusing. You refused the covenant of Allah. So this basically to make it short, Allah says only a minority, only a state uh, sincere. Now, still in Surah Al Baqarah, still talking about Bani Israel. Uh, this is a more specific example. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Alam tari ilal mala'i min Bani Israel, min ba'di Musa, is qalu li nabi illa. Basically, this was already after their, uh, you know, after their time of uh, their prime time after their time of strength they became weaker as a nation Bani Israel and they were you know constantly uh, bothered and fought by other nations perhaps the Persian per, uh, Persians perhaps the Romans so they were weaker and they said to their prophet because for Bani Israel in every generation they have a prophet so they went to their prophet and they say appoint for us a leader appoint for us a general a malik right, a king so that we can follow him and fight for the path of Allah they're giving this, you know, fantastic speech. We're going to fight for the sake of Allah. We're going to, you know, uh, strive for the sake of Allah. And the Prophet, their Prophet, alayhi salam, asked, قَالَ هَلْ عَسَيْتُمْ إِنْ كُتِبَ عَلَيْكُمُ الْقِتَالُ أَلَّا تُقَاتِلُوا Presumably, if Allah says that fighting has been uh, prescribed upon you, if Allah says fight, will you refrain from fighting? Will you, you know, uh, deny and refuse? And they say, قَالُوا وَمَا لَنَا أَلَّا نُقَاتِلَ فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ وَقَدَ أُخْرِجْنَا مِنْ دِيَارِنَا وَأَبَنَائِنَا What are you talking about? Of course we'll fight. Why wouldn't we fight? We have been ex expelled from our you know, homeland and our children, uh, they have you know, wronged us, they have made, uh, made us homeless. Why wouldn't we fight? But the result, فَلَمَّا كُتِبَ عَلَيْهُمُ الْقِتَالُ تَوَلَّوْا إِلَّا قَلِيلًا مِنْهُمْ but when Allah actually prescribed fighting upon them and did appoint a leader, which is Talut in Surah Al-Baqarah, which is not somebody they would, you know, they would think of as a leader. They would think we have, you know, 12 tribes and you can appoint one of us. We have, we have political uh, experience, right? We have wrong office before. You can choose one of us and we'll fight for the sake of Allah. But then due to the wisdom of Allah, he chose one that nobody has heard of, Talut. And they're like, who's this Talut? But the Prophet said, this is what Allah chose for you. And he has wisdom. And he has knowledge. You should follow him. They turned away. Who's this guy? We don't know him, right? So, illa qalila minhum. Except a minority of them. Only a small group did stay true to the promise of Allah. And did follow the uh, instructions of the Prophet. Wallahu alimun bi zalimin. And indeed, Allah is all aware of the wrongdoers. He knows about the rest. Moving on, just three ayat uh, later. When this fighting actually happens when this uh, you know they are fighting for the sake of Allah فَلَمَّا فَصَلَ طَالُوتُ بِالْجُنُودِ قَالَ إِنَّ اللَّهَ مُبْتَلِكُمْ بِالنَّحْرٍ فَمَنْ شَرِبَ مِنْهُ فَلَيْسَ مِنِّي وَمَنْ لَمْ يَتْعَمْهُ فَإِنَّهُ مِنِّي إِلَّا مَنْ يَقْتَرَفَ غُرْفَةً بِيَدِي Basically this leader Talut whom Allah chose said to the soldiers that indeed Allah will test you 
And here's a river. We're in the desert. Everybody's thirsty, but don't drink from it. Right? This is a test from Allah. Don't drink from it. Whoever drinks from it is not from me. You are not truly a follower. You are not truly a believer. But except those who use a very small handful. فَشَرِبُ مِنْهُ إِلَّا قَلِيلًا مِنْهُمْ So all of them drank except a few, except a minority. Again, only a few of them stayed firm uh, and, and followed the instructions of Talut, their leader. And then, فَلَمَّا جَاءَ جَاوَزَهُ هُوَ وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا مَعَهُ قَالُوا لَا تَقَتَلَ يَوْمَ الْجَالُوتِ أَبِ الْجَالُوتَ وَجُنُورِ When they actually encountered this army of Jalut, their enemy, most of them said, we're not going to win today. First of all, we're small in number. Second of all, not, nobody followed the instruction of the leader. Nobody listened to Talut. This is, this is a tragedy. We're going to lose anyway. But what did the, the, the truthful believers say? Those who are firm, they truly believe that they're going to meet Allah. And this is a phrase that's used very often uh, in the Quran. When they are firm that they're going to meet Allah, that means their faith is complete, right? They say, كم من فئاتين قليلاتين غلبت فئاتين كثيراتين بإذن الله How often does it happen? How many a small company has overcome a large company by the permission of Allah? Look at the confidence they had. They didn't say, عسى فئاتين قليلاتين غلبت فئاتين كثيراتين بإذن الله They didn't say it's possible. Perhaps we can overcome them as a small group by the permission of Allah. They said, كم as if it's normal. This is the normal case. This is something we're expecting. Of course we're going to win. Even though we are a small minority, but we have, by the permission of Allah, if we are on the side of Allah, of course, come. How often does it happen? They have this confidence. Wallahu ma'asabirin, and Allah is with the patient. What are you guys worrying about? This true believer says. So this is the kind of attitude we should have as well, a kind of confidence. And the the, the interesting thing is that fia, this word in Arabic language, doesn't necessarily mean a milit, uh, military group. There are other words for mili uh, military group, Jaish or Jund. Those are military fighting groups. But Fia literally means a category, a sort, a group. So it can refer to even a culture. It can refer to a way of thinking. It can refer to a lifestyle. It can refer to an industry. It can refer to entertainment, information, a, a subject in school. So basically, we can be influenced by all these things I just mentioned, right? When we live in a society, we can be influenced by the way that people live in this society. Hong Kong people work so hard, and then we are also forced and pushed to work as hard as them. This is just an example. So when they are saying this, they're not only talking about milit uh, military encounter. It says that a small group, by the permission of Allah, can overcome other cultures, other ways of thinking, other lifestyle, other attitudes towards life. You know, all these kind of things by the permission of Allah, and Allah is indeed with the patient. But the, the question is, on what are they basing this statement? Where did they get the idea? Why would they say that Cam, as it, so many, it has happened many times, what, what are they basing this statement on? Where did they get the idea? Now, of course, for believers, we draw reference from our previous nations, previous believers, right? previous prophets and messengers, and their people, and their followers. That's what believers do. And that's a large part portion of the Quran. The Quran has basically two categories of information. It has uh, ahkam, uh, rulings, things that you should do, things that you shouldn't do. And it has akhbar, news or information. And akhbar, a large part of it is stories about previous nations. Some of them we should learn lessons from, some of them we can follow, some of them we can imitate. So basically, this is also a nation of believers, Bani Israel. They are also drawing reference from previous nations. And we should do the same. And we actually have more reference. They become a story for us already. But when they, when they are saying this, they are talking about stories before. So let's try to see about uh, the previous nations, whether they dem uh, demonstrated this fact, كَمْ مِنْ فِيَةٍ قَلِيلَةٍ غَلَبَتْ فِيَةٍ كَثِيرَةٍ بِإِذْنِ اللَّهِ or not. What about people of Nuh? Let's follow the chronologic order, right? One of the earliest prophets. What about Prophet Nuh, alayhi salam? We know that he preached for 950 years, day and night, public and private, family and outside family. He was working hard. He was telling people, obey Allah, believe in Allah, accept the oneness of Allah, and you will be prosperous in the hereafter, and you will be happy, and you will be rewarded. But then, in this 950 years, there are different narrations, but even the maximum number of followers, less than 100, right? About 80 people followed him mm -hmm. after 950 years. And that's a tiny fraction, a small major, a minority of the, of the society. So when 
when 950 years passed and the people have shown that they are stubborn and they are firm, they will not no longer accept the message. They even started trying to uh, threaten Nuh al -Islam. They wanted to kill him. So Allah gave the command. Sorry. Uh, yeah. So Allah gave the command to Nuh al -Islam. And uh, basically he says that the ground will be flooded and you should build a ship and take uh, a peer of each creature and take your family and take those who follow you proceed to the ship whoever has believed and again again this 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 minority nature is being explicitly mentioned most of them did, did not believe Nuh only a small minority of them believed so it did apply to Nuh and this small minority did overcome the majority by the permission of Allah all of the rest of the people who were proud and who were hostile against Nuh and his people were uh, drawn in the water in the flood but the rest uh, those who followed Nuh were saved so this is an example of uh, you know what about Ibrahim it's a very interesting phrase in Surah Al-Nahl. Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala says, "Inna Ibrahim makana ummah." Indeed, Ibrahim Alislam was a ummah. He was a nation of himself, and that is already an indication of how few his followers were. Because you can imagine, we know that uh, Ibrahim Alislam, when he decided to worship Allah alone, when he become, uh, you know, a uh, a true Muslim and this word Muslim this phrase actually started from the time of Ibrahim Islam. his father basically discarded him his father disowned him I don't I don't have this son anymore and his father even encouraged the people allowed the people to burn him to death burn him be an individual in a nation that everybody else wants to burn him to death and this is a tiny tiny minority but he stayed true to Allah he was not among the mushrikeen. He did not uh, associate any partner with Allah. He was a tiny man minority. He was expelled from his hometown. But nobody remembers any of those who wanted to burn him to death. Everybody remembers Ibrahim Islam. Not only Muslims, Christians and, and Jewish people, they also honor Ibrahim Islam. But he was just one person in a nation. But he was uh, remembered and he's honored because he is on the side of Allah. <coughs> so the small quantity of this group did not limit them from being uh, honored by the later generations. What about, um, what about Musa Islam, one of the most mentioned prophet in the Quran? We know that Musa Islam went to Fir'aun and told him you should release the uh, children of Israel, let them follow me, you have been a wrongdoer and I want you to also believe in Allah the creator of the entire universe and of course Fir'aun is very arrogant he says Qala, Anna al -a right? I am the highest Lord you have what are you talking about I don't know of any other God except me he declared himself a God so uh, Musa AS, eventually after many years of struggling eventually managed to rescue these people the children of Israel and led them towards uh, the Red Sea uh, wanting to flee from Fir'aun, wanting to uh, escape from Fir'aun. And then uh, Allah said to Musa AS, travel by night um, with my servants, indeed you will be pursued. Allah already told them that um, you will be followed by the uh, people of Fir'aun. And then Fir'aun indeed sent his uh, police forces, SWAT, right, sent his soldiers to pursue these people. And he made a statement Small group, a small band of people, small company He was very arrogant Just a, you know, just a few followers And we have such a big army We're such a strong nation Of course we, we're going to destroy them Go ahead, follow them But then we all know the end of this story when they, went to, when they reached the side of the Red Sea And then many people among the followers of Musa Lost hope They were desperate They were like, okay, this is the end of our life Look at what you got us into they, they're already here, we have no arms, we have no weapon there's n nobody to help us, we are weak, they're strong this is the end of us and what did Musa Islam say? Kalla, never you're, you're not making any sense Inna ma'ya Rabbi sayahdi there's no doubt about it, my Lord is with me 
and he definitely will guide me. What are you worrying about? And then he was inspired to strike the ocean with his stuff. The ocean parted, they, they uh, safely passed, and the people of Fir'aun were buried under the sea. And the statement before, remember when Fir'aun said they were just a small band, as if we can, we can destroy them easily, but then they were destroyed easily, without even having to fight. The people of Musa Alayhi didn't even have to fight them, and then they were destroyed. This is another example from the previous nations of Fiatun Qalilatun Ghalabat Fiatun Kathiratun Bi'ithni Allah. That bred by the permission of Allah, a small group, a minority, overcome uh, a majority group by the permission of Allah. So, and in this, in this same surah, Surah Al-Shu'ara, interestingly, Allah ended by summarizing, Inna fi dhalika la ayah. Indeed, in this, in this story, in this history, there is a sign, وَمَا كَانَ أَكْثَرَهُمْ مُؤْمِنِينَ but most of them are not believers. So the story and this statement are interestingly connected to each other. The story is about a minority overcoming a majority. And Allah ends by saying, but the majority were not believers. That's why, that's why they were able to overcome the majority. And even, uh, you know, we have looked at the story of Nuh Islam. We have looked at the story of Ibrahim Islam, Musa Islam. What about our own Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? We are aware of the story of Badr, the Battle of Badr. When they had no, they were basically refugees at first, right? The, the Muhajirun. And the Ansar, they were poor as well. Their fathers have been fighting with each other all the time. They had no resources. They had no good weapon. They were very poor. And they were a recently combined nation. They didn't even have their own culture yet. But when the enemy comes, by the permission of Allah, they were able to win over this enemy that's three times stronger in terms of number and so many times stronger in terms of equipment, in terms of weapons. By the permission of Allah, another example that still applies to even the final Prophet وسلم, that a minority group can overcome a majority group if they are on the side of Allah. So, so eventually in a later surah, in Surah Al-Waqi'ah, which many of you uh, have already memorized, Allah made it even more explicit. He describes the Day of Judgment and says, وَكُنْتُمْ أَزْوَاجًا ثَلَاثًا You will become three categories. You will be divided into three categories. فَأَصْحَابُ الْمَيْمَنَ مَا أَصْحَابُ الْمَيْمَنَ There will be people of the right hand. وَأَصْحَابُ الْمَشْأَمَ مَا أَصْحَابُ الْمَشْأَمَ There will be people of the left hand. And basically, people of the right hand are referring to those who will enter Jannah, right? Also, they will accept the book in their right hand. فَأَمَّا مَا أُوْتِيَ كِتَابَهُ بِيَمِينِ That is a symbol of them having succeeded, having earned the pleasure of Allah. They have more good deeds and they will enter Jannah. And people of the left hand on the other side, uh, on the other hand, they received their book from behind their back and also in their left hand and they had more good uh, wrongdoing, they had more bad deeds and they earned the wrath of Allah and they will go to Jahannam. May Allah protect us and not make any of us from them. <coughs> but there is a third group, وَسَابِقُونَ sabiqun, And there are the forerunners, the leaders basically. <coughs> those who are in the front, those who are ahead of others. <laughs> they are the ones that are close to Allah. They're not only in the presence of Allah, they're not enjoying the pleasure of Jannah, they're close to Allah. <laughs> and they're in a, a plural form, Jannat, many gardens. They're in many gardens with pleasures. Sulatun min al awwalin, you know, many, uh, a large number from the early generations, from the awwalin, wa qalilun min al akhirin, and a small proportion. Uh, a few of the later peoples. This is a very explicit uh, interpretation already. Allah says that basically there will be, there will be more sabiqun, more forerunners, more uh, you know, uh, believers who are ahead of others in the earlier generations than the later generations. And this is also uh, supported by a hadith from the Prophet وسلم, when he said, this is uh, narrated by Imran ibn uh, Hussein. The Prophet ﷺ said, خيركم قرني ثم الذين يلونهم ثم الذين يلونهم ثم الذين يلونهم In this narration he said thrice, and in other narrations maybe twice. And we hear this quite often in our Jum'ah khutbah, right? Uh, the Prophet ﷺ said, the best of you are my generation, those who are with me, and then, then those who follow them, and then those who follow them, and then those who follow them. So basically, those the generations that are closer to his generation are better than those who are further away. And this logically makes sense, right? If you think about it, the, the people who have seen the Prophet ﷺ, have sat with him, have heard him speak, had fought with him, of course they're better than us. They have much more to relate to, right? Hanzala, he, he blamed himself for a change of, uh, of 
basically iman when he when he said that I am when I'm with the Prophet وسلم, I feel as if Jannah and Jahannam are in front of my eyes as if I can see them with my bare eyes but when I go back home when I'm with my families my, my wife and my children my iman becomes low and I become more you know attracted by the worldly affairs so he said nafaka handallah Handala has become a hypocrite he's blaming himself and he told Abu Bakr about it and Abu Bakr said Wallahi, I'm the same. I'm also a hypocrite. This is terrible. Let's go to the Prophet together, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. They went to the Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and the Prophet, Alayhi Salatu Wasallam, told them, Ya Handala, if you can keep the Iman as when you are with me all the time, angels will descend and shake your hand. Meaning it's not that achievable. It's not, you know, possible for every uh, person at any time. It's a very high state of Iman, and it's natural for our Iman to have ups and downs. So he said, Sa'atun wa sa'a. There's an hour for this and an hour for that. There's also hour to spend with your families, even though you might be less aware of the hereafter. You must be less attentive to the hereafter. But that's Sa'atun wa sa'a. There's an hour for this and an hour for that. So that's okay. We are influenced by our environment uh, naturally. So, but this uh, hadith and the previous, uh, the, the, the passage from Surah Al Waqi'ah tells us that the, the later. Uh, you know, the further away our generation is from the Prophet, the more m uh, minor we will be in terms of number, the less there will be of believing uh, believers, uh, firm believers, those who st uh, stay true to the promise of Allah. So this is not something that's shocking, right? Sometimes Muslims become very sad and they say, look at the word, you know, this is so sad, Muslims are l l losing their Iman. This is already expected by the Prophet and by Allah. This is a natural process. The, the later it is, the harder it will, will be for a person to stick uh, to the, you know, to the deen and to be a firm believer. And that's why if you are a firm believer, if I am a firm believer by the, uh, by the permission of Allah, we should feel happy about it. We are in later generations. We have less access. We have, you know, less contact to the legacy of the Prophet Wasallam. But if we can still stay true to this religion, if we can still remain firm on this religion, then we are precious, right? The, the, the less a material is, the more precious it is. Gold is more expensive than silver because there's less gold. It's as simple as that. So we shouldn't feel sad about being a minority. Indeed, there is honor of being a minority. There is value of you being a minority. And uh, there is another hadith narrated by Abdullah ibn Mas'ud. And this one is famous. Many of us know it. Uh, the Prophet وسلم, said, Inna al -Islama إن الإسلام بدأ غريبا وسيعود غريبا كما بدأ فطوبى للغرباء. He said, indeed, Islam began as something strange, as something weird even, and it shall return as something strange. So طوبى is for the strangers, for those who are strange. And the the محدثون they commented that طوبى can be the name of a great tree in Jannah. So it's a symbol of Jannah. So Jannah is for the strangers basically, glad tidings to the strangers. Why does he say that? Um, we can understand why Islam began as something strange because the Quraysh were uh, idol worshipping people they were not like the uh, Christians or the Jews they had no history of uh, Tawheed at all they didn't understand why there would be one God only so when the Prophet وسلم, said La ilaha illallah it's gharib strange what are you talking about we have 360 idols right every, every tribe has its own idol what are you talking about one God that's crazy and when he says we may have rights to inheritance heritage and he says that's crazy غريب. that's strange we've never treated women that way you're 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 talking nonsense and when he says that we're all in the uh, in the mumin, uh, mumin, ikhwa, right all believers are brothers that's strange we are only brothers to our tribes to our tribal ties we should fight with each other that's how we live so Islam and the teachings of Islam was very strange to them it was not easy for them to accept uh, that we can understand but the Prophet وسلم, said, just like when it was strange back then, it shall be again strange at the later times, when, it, when it's close to the end of time, basically, when Islam is about to return, when the, the Day of Judgment is about to be established, it will become strange. And actually, we can already sense that kind of strangeness of Islam in the world. Aren't we saying that? The media talks about Islam as if it's a very strange thing already. They, talk, they de uh, demonize it. They try to speak of Islam as a, 
incompatible thing to human society, something that's so alien. They try to marginal marginalize it. And even in academic papers, scholars are supposed to be unbiased. But then when they talk about the Muslim word or the Islamic word, there's a clear uh, tendency to talk about it as if it's the other. It's different. It's not us. It's not a part of us. It's I even not human, right? So it has become gharib. I, you know, in a way, we are already approaching that time, or even in that time, that Islam is uh, gharib. It's strange, and it's not easy being strange. We all know that. We don't want to be strange. We want to be normal, right? Normative uh, conformity. But the Prophet, in order to strengthen the strangers, he said, "Fatuba lil ghuraba," right? The the polite tidings to the strangers. Don't be afraid of being strange. If being strange means being true to Allah, don't be afraid. And don't feel shy to be, to be different. If being different means sticking to the deen, it's okay to be different. So they, all of the Muslims in Mecca at the early time, they were all very different. They were considered also a terrorist group, right? <laughs> Trying to mess us up. And Omar ibn al-Khattab was very angry at the Prophet وسلم, before he became a Muslim because you're messing up the society. Brothers and, you know, brothers and sisters are fighting because some of them are Muslims, some of them are, uh, are not. Sons and daughters are fighting with their parents because they, they want to stay with you. They don't want to stay with their families. You're messing our society up. Uh, but they endured the strangeness. They were okay with being strange. And then they, they eventually became successful. And you know, there was a long period of time when they were not strange, when they were normal. When Islam represents civilization, when Islam represents uh, ac you know, academic excellence, when Islam represents uh, being a hat in every subject. And, but the thing is, being strange back then and being strange here in our time, the gharib is a little different. Being strange back then, uh, except for the you know, uh, difference in attitude that we, I just mentioned, there's also basically just small in number. At first they were small in number. But right now we're actually not very small in number. In our society we are, but you know, in a global sense, Conservatively speaking, there are 1.6 billion Muslims, about 23.5% of the whole world's population. That's one in every four person, right? It's not very little. We actually have a significant mem uh, number in human population. So the gharib in our time may refer to something else. And we can draw some inspiration from another quite long hadith. It's about l later times as well. Uh, due to limitation of time, I'll just go to the translation directly. So the Prophet wasallam said, the people will soon summon one another to attack you as people when eating inviting uh, invite each other to share their dish so you know how people say you know ajan let's go have dinner together acha let's go uh, nowadays uh, he says there will come a time when people will say let's kill a muslim acha let's go they will do that <laughs> why why is that they're they're shocked the believers are shocked right so they ask is that because min qillatin nahnu yawma idhin ya rasulullah is that because we're so small in number that we're weak and the Prophet وسلم, said, Bal, Antum Yomaidin Kathir. On this day you will be a lot there will be a lot of you. You are great in number. There are many Muslims. Muslims are everywhere. But you will be like the foam that's carried uh, carried away by torrent or by a straight stream. You are you have no firmness, you have no determination. You are carried by a stream to wherever the stream goes. And this is a very you know accurate actually uh, description of when we talk about social trends, it's the same thing, right? If you don't have firmness, if you, ha you don't have a core reference that you stick to, you will be carried away just like a stream, uh, just like a foam in a stream. And Allah will take fear of you from the breasts of your enemy. And the interesting thing, the, thing, the word in the Arabic, uh, you know, original Arabic is mahaba, and it's different from khawf. It's not fear because of strength. Mahaba is a kind of respectful fear because of dignity. When you look at your father who's very knowledgeable, who's very disciplined, you have a fear towards him, but it's a loving kind of fear out of his dignity. Similarly, we sometimes have fear towards our scholars, right, elderly, because they have dignity, they have heba, and we have mahaba, that kind of fear towards him. So the Prophet ﷺ said, your enemies will not have mahaba of you anymore because you won't have dignity anymore. They will not fear you or respect you anymore because you don't respect yourself anymore. Because you become more, you become more, uh, uh, how to say, attracted by this word, which is coming after. And he says, Allah will put al-wahan in your heart. And the people asked, what is wama al-wahan? What is al-wahan? He says, hubbu dunya wa karahiyatul maut. The love for this dunya and the dislike of death. And that thing will make your enemies not fear you anymore and will make you very weak, and will make people call upon each other to attack you. Al-wahan, the love for this word 
and dislike of a death. And I just, uh, I recently had the pleasure of visiting a local Pakistani family, a very beautiful family, and it just uh, it inspired me of something. The father is a very simple worker, works in Hong Kong, gets a normal pay, average pay. But whatever saving he has, he sends it back to Pakistan to buy houses, to buy lands, right, to invest. He doesn't spend the money here in Hong Kong. So imagine this person. Assume one day he's old and he says, I want to retire now, I don't want to work anymore, and I want to go back to Pakistan. And when he's on the flight back to Pakistan, will this person feel sad? Will this person feel regretful? No, he has everything good waiting for him in Pakistan. He has houses there, he has land there. He has a, a lot of good, goodness waiting for him now. So he's looking forward to it. He's happy about this flight. He's happy about this departure. Now that, I want to use that as an uh, uh, analogy for death. Why do we fear death? Because we have established everything in this life. We have not established anything for the hereafter. So when we, wa when we are going to leave this world, it's as if leaving our land and houses and all the goodness and going to a strange land with nothing waiting for us. But if a person truly invested for the hereafter, live the simple life in this world, may not be the richest, may not be the most famous, doesn't have a reputation, but he's prepared for himself a lot in the hereafter. So when he is about to die, when she is about to die, this person will feel just like the man on that flight to Pakistan. Everything's good waiting for me. I'm happy, I'm looking forward to it. So, so the, 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 the phrase that you will be, you will, the alwahi is love of this word and dislike of death, indicates that we're working more on this word. We're not working enough for the hereafter. We're only concentrating on our uh, you know, investment in this word. We're not concentrating on the investment of the hereafter. We're worrying about people's opinion in this word. We're not worried about Allah's opinion in the hereafter. We're worried about where to, where to go tomorrow. We're not worried about where to go on the day of judgment. And this is something we have to change. And when we change this, we, when we have a different view towards the world, when we have a different view towards how to live our life, we, when we don't have al wahan we will become strong again. We will have that dignity again. And it's not about number, right? The, the people back then, when Umar ibn al-Khattab went to take Jerusalem, he was with one servant and a donkey. And they, they didn't look very strong, right? And they were taking turns to ride on that donkey. And when they approached Jerusalem, it's the servant's turn. So Omar was walking on the, on the, on the, uh, just on the ground. And then the Romans, they, were, they had red carpets basically, waiting for this great Omar, the conqueror Omar. Everybody has heard of him. And they had soldiers on both sides with very beautiful form, right? But they say, who is this guy? Doesn't look like the conqueror, doesn't look like uh, you know, a strong person at all. And then they, they sort of, uh, they were confused. And then a Muslim, who was basically a delegate at the Roman Empire at the time, he even felt shy. So he approached Omar and he said, Ya Amir al muminin this is a little inappropriate, you know. This is a social event. You should wear nicely, right? You should have a beautiful clothes. You should have, you know, uh, soldiers following you so that we can show our hiba, we can show our demeanor, we can show our uh, honor. We can have some kind of uh, karama, a kind of honor and dignity. And Omar basically was angry. He said, how, how can you see this? We were a, a simple nation and we were actually a, uh, basically a dishonored nation. Yeah, we were a humiliated nation because of our tribal fight and our idol worship. Allah honored us by Islam. Allah didn't honor us by beautiful clothes and by soldiers. Allah honored us by Islam. It is our faith. It is our true belief. It is our pursuit of the hereafter that makes us honorable. Not beautiful carpets, not beautiful clothes. So he just entered Jerusalem like that. But nowadays, we seem to be lacking that kind of confidence in our deen. We try to find honor. We try to try to make others think good of us through other means, right? Through material means. And that's the difference between the later generations and the earlier generations, the awwaleen and the uh, and the akhirin. So let's look at it from another perspective. Allah says, uh, we, we've looked at how Allah talks about minority, qalil, the fi'at the, the in qalil. What does Allah say about kathir? What, what does Allah say about majority? Most people. And you'll find it, there are even more verses about kathir or akthar. Here he says, it, is it not true that every time they took a covenant, a party of them threw it away? Bal akhtharuhum la yu'minun. And the majority of them do not believe, do not truly believe. They don't have iman. There are many verses of this. It is 
Allah who made for you the night that you may rest therein and the day giving sight. Indeed, Allah is full of bounty to the people. And the majority of people, most people are not grateful. Moving on. And they say, what, why has a sign not been sent down to him from his Lord? Say, indeed, Allah is able to send down a sign. But most people are not aware. Most people don't know. When they see a sign, they don't realize it's a sign. They don't take lesson from it. Sheikh Omar Suleiman says, you know, we, we nowadays tend to complain about the Jum'ah Khutbah a lot, right? Uh, this Sheikh doesn't have knowledge. His Arabic is so bad. And he doesn't know his, what he's talking about. He has a strong Pakistani accent or whatever. We try to complain. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Apologies. Here, he has a strong Chinese accent. Oh, and look at that Chinese guy. What is, is that a beard? I can't even see it, right? We complain about Juma Khutbah and, and we say there's no ayah for us in this. There's no, nothing that we can take lesson from. But Umar Suleiman says if Umar ibn Khattab was sitting there, he might be crying while all of, all of the rest of you are complaining. Because it's not only about the presenter of the information, it's also about the receiver. It's also about whether you are sensitive enough whether you are willing to be reminded by Allah. So a lot of times, this happens a lot, right? You're, if you go to some other countries, you go, go back to Pakistan, you're listening to a khutbah, some other people are at the edge of falling asleep, or already asleep, but other people are very tentative. It's the same khutbah, it's the same person talking about the same thing, but they're experiencing very different emotions, very different uh, feedback. So that's why it's also about us. So that's why Allah says, وَلَكِنْ أَكْثَرَهُمْ لَا يَعْلَمُونَ It's not that Allah doesn't give signs. There are plenty of signs. فِي السَّمَاءِ وَفِي الْأَرْضِ In the heavens and the skies, there are many signs for people who understand, for people who think. But the most of them just don't think. And, then, and we did not find for most of them any covenant. But indeed, وَإِنْ وَجَدْنَا أَكْثَرَهُمْ لَفَاسِقِينَ Most of them, majority of them, are wrongdoers, are defiantly disobedient. And then, or do they say, is he uh, in madness? Is he a madman? Rather, he brought them the truth. Most of them, the majority of them, are basically hateful to the truth. They don't want to accept the truth. Because to accept the truth means sacrifice. To accept the truth means that you reprioritize things. That you sometimes have to leave things that you like for something that Allah likes. Although it is a promise of Allah that whoever gives up something that the person likes for the pleasure of Allah, Allah will replace it with something much better. So if we understand that we're not sacrificing anything, but most people, according to Allah, they don't like the truth. They hate the truth. There are people who know Islam is the truth, but they just hate it so much. And we have example from previous nations. There are some among Bani Israel, among the children of Israel. They know the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, is truly a Prophet and Messenger of Allah, but they just hate him so much. They just, how can he be a Messenger and a Prophet, though he doesn't have any, he doesn't even know how to write or read. This is unfair. And that's why they hated them. They were not humble. So, uh, this is the, basically the end of the quotes from the Quran. And those are basically theoretical uh, lessons that make us more confident and more okay with being a minority. Look at how Allah talks about minority over and over and over again as the successful group, as the group that Allah is pleased with. And look at how Allah talks about the majority group over and over and over again as la yashkurun, they're not grateful, la ya'lamun, they don't know, la yu'minun, they don't believe, bil karihun, they are hateful to the truth. So it doesn't, it's not a problem, it's not a bad thing to be a minority, if being a minority means that you're on the side of Allah. And you are not a minority anymore if you are aware that Allahu waliyu ladina amanu. Allah is a friend to the believers, is a protecting friend to the believers. We are not a minority. It, it only appears that we are a minority. So, what are some of the practical advice that we can uh, remind ourselves and our uh, family members to stay strong as a minority? Because we, do, we are exposed to the psychological push, the intrinsic nature and the forces of informational uh, conformity and normative conformity. What are some of the practical uh, things we can do to try to struggle with that and try to be strong as a minority? <coughs> so basically, first of all, Allah says, Ya uh, amanu taqullaha wa kunu ma'a sadiqeen. He says, O you who have believed, fear Allah, be conscious of Allah and stay with the truthful people. Stay with the sadiqeen. 
And this is especially important for people who are living in a minority society. It is not easy for us to have Muslim colleagues, to have Muslim classmates. We are a minority already. And that, there's, that's more reason for us to stay with the truthful people, to remind each other that you are not alone, to remind each other that I am the same with you, that I am here for you, I can, I can support you, and we are pursuing the same thing. And remember, in the video, in the conformity theory, when in the second experiment, when, the, uh, um, the, when there's only one person uh, knowing the correct answer, but the others are pretending and giving the wrong answer, 37% of time he would go with the group, right? But when he has one partner, just one partner, they are still a minority. It's two against two against four. They are still a minority. But just because of one partner, the, the uh, percentage of conformity reduces to 5%. That shows the importance of having a partner that supports you. And it's, it's not about quantity, it's just about being supported. You have someone with you. So whenever you pray at an airport, it is not only beneficial to yourself, for example. It is giving confidence to other Muslims. When somebody sees you, hey, he's praying at the airport, why should I be afraid? I'm also a Muslim. I can do it the same way. So when you are, and when you are outspokenly uh, you know, supporting Islam in your Facebook page, for example, in your uh, daily acquaintance with other people, in your conversation with other people, you are not only doing yourself a benefit. I, I went to, last year when I went to interview at an uh, NGO, and they learned that I'm a Muslim. Before I asked, they said, okay, we're going to arrange a room for you to pray. And I said, how do you know that I need a room to pray? They said, we had a colleague before who's a Muslim, and he prays five times a day. So that person who I don't know supported me, reinforced me by being you know, confident and being uh, firm to his deen. When we become firm to our deen, we're benefiting others as well, uh, especially when we are a minority. So that's the first thing, to stay with the truthful people. And this kind of gathering is one of the uh, most important ways to do that. We have to know each other. We have to, uh, you know, make acquaintance with each other and then they, we can uh, support each other uh, on different levels. And then the second reminder is uh, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, uh, to the Prophet sallallahu So remind, remind them because indeed reminders benefit the believers. The word, you know, zakara uh, literally means to repeat something that's already mentioned. If it's a new information, it wouldn't be zakara anymore. So it means that when you hear a, a khutbah or a sharing, I believe actually, since many of you are more knowledgeable than me, most of this information you are already aware, you know these things, but it's still and to listen attentively to our khutbas because human beings tend to forget. We hear something and then it, you know, it goes to the back of our head. It doesn't motivate us to do things anymore. That's why we need to be reminded over and over again. And that's why we recite the Quran five times in our prayers a day to be reminded. Uh, you know, there are hufat. You can see they've already memorized the Quran. Why do they need to recite the Quran, right? But they also need to be reminded. So remind and be reminded share reminders uh, between each other. And then the third piece of advice is to remember Allah open. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Again, He says, Oh, you who have believed, when you incline, uh, then you have to be an enemy group, a hostile group, but a group that's different, that basically distracts you from your deen. Or, or compete with you uh, in terms of your deen. Be firm, first of all. Uh, be firm. And remember Allah a lot. It's not only to remember Allah, but constantly, repetitively, uh, plentifully remember Allah. In order for you to be successful, so that you can be successful. Remember the story of uh, Ashab al-Kahf, the people of the cave, in Surah al-Kahf. They were also a minority, right? Only a few young people. They, they were, uh, you know, monotheists, while the rest of the people just followed uh, the culture of the time or the trend of the time and started worshipping idols. And when Allah said, وَرَبَطُنَا عَلَىٰ قُلُوبِهِمْ إِذْ قَامُوا فَقَالُوا رَبُّنَا رَبُّ السَّمَوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ لَنْ نَدْعُوا مِنْ دُونِهِ إِلَاهَ Allah said, I made firm their heart, right? I made their heart firm. And when they stood up, they said, Our Lord is the Lord of the heavens and the earth, and we will not worship anyone except Him. So the first thing they did, they remembered Allah. Their statement is revolving around Allah. And to remember Allah doesn't only mean to remember that He exists. That is easy. 
To remember Allah also means to remember His attributes, what, who Allah is, what He can do, His might and His power, to, to remember His teachings. That is also remembrance. When you are anxious about your provision, right, when you lose your job, when you are in a turbulent stage of your life, remember that Allah is Ar-Razaq. He is the one that provides. And if He can create the heavens and the earth without any fatigue, not tired at all, why is it hard for Him to provide for you a daily meal? It's easy for him. And when you are, you know, being wronged, when others wrong you, remember that Allah is Al-Adl. He's the fear one. He, maybe you will be wronged in this world, but you will not be wronged in the hereafter. And by being wronged, your sins are being expiated. So, there, whenever we encounter something, we can, we can remember something about Allah that will cheer us up. When you, are, when you feel that your life is full of negativity, and that you are not finding any, any uh, joy in your life, remember that Allah is Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim. His mercy encompasses all things. His mercy even encompasses non-believers. Why wouldn't He have mercy upon you? So, all these examples uh, are just how we should remember Allah as a minority and that strengthens us as a minority. And then the fourth uh, piece of advice uh, on a practical level how to be a minority is that we should represent ourselves. And that uh, a little bit, uh, how to say, uh, basically, in a society when we are a minority, the majority group hears more about the minority group from themselves rather than from this minority group. To make that simple, uh, most non-Muslims watch news and learn about Islam instead of going to Muslims and learn about Islam because there are just so few Muslims and not all of them know any Muslims. So we should make an effort to actively represent ourselves. Representation is a very important term, uh, especially after the media becomes so prevalent. If we don't represent ourselves, be sure that we will be represented by others and 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 don't blame others for misrepresenting you if you don't make an effort to represent yourself so when others for example i find there's a uh, there's a website in china called uh, juhu which is similar to koro it's a q and a website people ask questions about islam uh, and 99% uh, of the answers are from non muslims and you can imagine they're you know really weird answers i'm like Really? I've never heard of that before. They say the Prophet said this. I'm like, really? Never heard of that before. So they are representing Islam, but that's misrepresentation. And I have to make an effort to represent within my capacity, although I am maybe one against 99, but the existence of this one is very important so that people have a different perspective. They, they can learn about Islam from a Muslim perspective. So represent yourself. And uh, how many of us here know Muhammad Ali, the boxer? Almost everybody. And how, how many of us here know Malcolm X? About half, right? So actually Muhammad Ali, he uh, became a Muslim because of Malcolm X. Malcolm X was a civil rights leader in the United States during the 1960s and 50s. So he, the, what's amazing about him is that he was a minority of a minority. He was an African-American Muslim, a black Muslim. And at that time in America, that's endangered species. That's more rare than a Chinese Muslim in Hong Kong. 50,000. <laughs> we have 50,000. So at that time, it was, you know, and not only African-American Muslim, as an American Muslim, when he went to Hajj, when people heard that you're from America, you're from American Muslim, they're like, oh my God, I've never seen one before. Right? That's, why, that's partially why people were so nice to him. Well, that's a little part of, uh, another part is we're Muslims, we should be nice to each other. But, you know, Malcolm X was a minority of a minority. He was uh, a small group, a tiny, tiny group in American society at that time. But he was courageous enough, brave enough to represent himself. He was brave enough to speak out and to challenge the majority group. And he was brave enough to say whatever he's thinking. He says uh, that uh, America has democracy. But those of, those of you who know democracy knows democracy is hypocrisy. And he's, he's willing to challenge those things. And he's a fantastic an orator, a great, great speaker. So I encourage you to watch some of his videos. Although at his earlier years, he had some wrong understandings about Islam. But his life is one of self-invention. He constantly changed his views. He constantly rectified himself. And especially after Hajj, he's become a very, very good Muslim. Uh, and you, uh, I truly encourage you to uh, watch some of his videos and to read the book Autobiography of Malcolm X. It's one of my favorite books and you can learn a lot about not only Islam but also how to be a minority in general from Malcolm X. So I think uh, my time is uh, used up but uh, we've been talking about how to 
you know, overcome the challenges and obstacles of being a minority, as if being a minority is definitely a negative thing. And I want to end by saying it's not. Uh, I mentioned earlier, uh, you know, briefly that being a minority firstly means you are precious, right? Uh, because whatever is rare is precious. You should have that uh, self-esteem. You should have that self-admiration. If you are the only Muslim in your workplace, be, be proud of it and be proud of your Islam and to show your Islam proudly. If you are the only Muslim student in your university, be proud of that. Establish an MSA for yourself, Muslim Students Association for yourself. And uh, it is only through that kind of positive, uh, you know, positive self-understanding can we be strong as a minority group. And another benefit of being a minority group is actually that we have a duty to convey Islam to others and we have the opportunity to convey Islam to others. You, you go outside and there are so many da'wah material, not material, da'wah subjects that you can approach uh, with your da'wah material to tell them about Islam. You know, I literally heard a brother say to me, it's, uh, I think it's, a, I don't remember where exactly he's from, I think he's from uh, Qatar or, uh, or Kuwait, it's a Muslim country, right? He said, I envy you. You have so many non-Muslims around, you can talk to them about Islam. I have never seen a non-Muslim in my life, <laughs> right? So it's a, it's a kind of an opportunity for us. I was, uh, in 2015, I was in the United States. After my exchange semester, I decided to go to the West Coast for a quick trip. I was in San Francisco, I uh, accidentally walked into a very rich neighborhood, and there was a very luxury masjid. It's like, it's like a palace, very beautiful. I was in there, and again, being a Chinese Muslim, they were like endangered species, we've never seen, seen one before. And everybody was very shocked, where are you from brother? China. Oh my god, China, never seen one before. So please sit down, something, let's have a conversation. We had a nice conversation. The first thing they asked is, you know, how many Muslims are there in China? And I said about, you know, 25 million, less than 30 million. That's a, a lot in number, but in terms of percentage in China, it's a very, very small fraction. And then the first reply this brother gave me, he's from Bangladesh originally, but he's the imam of that masjid. He says, you know, you have a heavy duty. You have a responsibility. 1.3 billion people, hardworking, friendly, nice people, who don't even know about the hereafter. What a shame. It's, it's, it's your duty, it's your responsibility to, to let them know at least. Whether to pursue it or not is their own choice, but you have to let them know. And it's our duty as well in Hong Kong. Right? Most Hong Kong people also don't know about the hereafter. 95% uh, Hong Kong uh, population are Chinese people who don't really know what they're believing in, according to my experience. They have some cultural traditions, but they don't really attach that much to it. So it's our opportunity and it's our duty as well, responsibility, to convey Islam to them, to have that conversation with them, to tell, tell them, why am I wearing a hijab? Why do I have a beard? Although it's not very visible. Um, why am I going to the masjid on Friday? Why do I not drink alcohol? All of those are opportunities, precious opportunities as a minority group. So I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us strong as a minority group and make us benefit from us being a minority and make us benefit the majority group, although we are a minority. And may he make us firm on this deen and uh, may he have mercy on us in the hereafter so that we can be successful in the hereafter. I mean, subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik ashadu wa la ilaha illa ant astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you very much for that very, very important talk. Um, I just uh, want to make a quick announcement that uh, we, our Sorry? schedules here are conflicting a little bit with the Kaul Masjid uh, Jamaat time for Isha. However, we have referred this matter to a scholar, uh, Sheikh McCarthy, who said that because since these things are very, very important, and you know, other countries overseas, they have a madrasa at the same time, uh, it's in the masjid and they have the lectures there as well. This is not a madrasa, as you know, it's just an education center. Um, but however, Sheikh McCarthy did tell us that if you pray in Jamaat after the lecture, that would be good. But uh, education is important as well, so which we need. Um, however, seasonally, maybe the Kabul Masjid later on will have their Isha at maybe 8.10, 8.15, 8.20. Then, inshallah, we'll end our job. Because if we make it 6.30, a lot of people can't make it. So we have chosen 7 o'clock, and I hope that uh, there's no interest, uh, conflict of interest here. Uh, obviously, Jamaat is very important, uh, but we can make it here as well. For those who would like to, uh, who, who desire to pray Jamaat together, we we'll pray in 15, 20 minutes, inshallah, after everybody is making dua, uh, uh, wudu, sorry. And uh, inshallah, as you know, we're Muslim Council of Hong Kong.
please support us. We are trying to collaborate. We're trying to provide education materials as much as possible. We're making dawah every second weekend uh, uh, on Saturdays. So please support us with your duas and uh, financially, uh, however you can, with your help, uh, we're very, very grateful. Jazakallah can follow us. I think I have one. Yeah? yeah. Oh, can you give me that? Yes. Um, Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam. Brother, for your peace. So, uh, after hearing from you, I have an opinion. Just I want to rectify it whether I'm right or wrong. So, you have talked about uh, minority. So, sitting here, I'm thinking that uh, in Hong Kong, the Muslims are minority. And the people who come here, are the minority among the minority and the people who are uh, staying in country like Pakistan or in Bangladesh or Indonesia where the Muslims are majority but I think still the people who are doing the Dawah work or who are following uh, exactly the Muslim, uh, Islam the rules of Islam they are the, also the minor, uh, minority in the majority countries so am I right or wrong? Just yeah. Uh, thank you very much, brother, for that um, observation. It is true that uh, many speakers have commented that even in Muslim world nowadays, even in Muslim countries, those who are truly practicing and those who are truly following uh, the Prophet Sunnah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is also a minority even in Muslim countries. And uh, it can be true, but the, uh, uh, my personal take on this question is that if a, bird, uh, if a person claims to be a Muslim, then whether he's a good Muslim or not is between him and Allah. That's something that we don't comment on. That's something we, of course, we try to make each other better Muslims always, right? But then whether a person is a practicing Muslim or not, uh, that really depends on uh, something that we don't see, which, which is taqwa. Allah says, In akramakum Allahi atqakum. The best among you are those who have most taqwa, and that's something we don't see. And I want to relate to something that Muhammad Ali said, actually. You know, Muhammad Ali is a very... People say he's an arrogant person, but he's actually a very proud person, right? He says, I'm the, pr I'm the greatest of all time. Every, every time before his uh, boxing race with somebody, he would say, Joe Fraser is so ugly, so ugly that I don't want to see his face when I fight him, right? Very arrogant person. Uh, people would say that he's a very arrogant person. And he says, you know, after I die, there will be no boxing. I mean, there will be the, still be the sports boxing, but it will never be as entertaining as I'm here. But once, one day, a, a, a young fan asked him a question. We know that you are a great boxer, we know that you are a Muslim. And you say you are the greatest boxer of all time. Would you consider yourself the best Muslim of all time, the greatest Muslim of all time? Surprisingly, it's really shocking, Muhammad Ali became very humble. And he said, whether a person is a good Muslim or not is up, is up to God. I don't say that. So that, you know, that is true understanding of Islam. So maybe, yes, it's true that we are a minority. Uh, but we still have hope in each and husna dhun, good assumption of every Muslim brother. I will try to rectify each other. Yeah. Take uh, second last question. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullah. Thank you, brother, for your uh, good understanding about Islam and uh, the, the word minority. You just make good contextualize it with the Quranic and Sunnah. It was a good theory in terms of relating what minority mean in terms of Quran and Sunnah. But I was thinking about from a practical perspective. Mm. Being a minority in Hong Kong, in other contexts, everyone experiences it very differently, right? So, being a minority means it's a very personal experience. Mm. I was expecting from uh, the topic that there would be kind of your personal being a Muslim in Hong Kong. How do you think about it? How do you feel about being a Muslim? And how do you behave in a practical way? So that, based on that experience, what others could learn about it. So theoretically it was very nice. It would be good if you could some other time if possible, based on your personal experience and how you feel being a Muslim in Hong Kong, what kind of feelings do you have? 
and what kind of behaviors do you do have and how can you make it better so this could be could have been better based on the personal mm. experience because being being a muslim is a very much personal experience mm. and each one of us do experience different mm. right that would be very helpful in future it's jazakallah khair brothers very important advice yeah, yeah after oh, uh, it's very true that sometimes we can um, have personal experience of being a minority uh, but the reason why I kept it more general and open uh, even when I give the practical experience uh, is that you know a, a person's personal experience might not be applicable to others but when I keep it general others can get the idea of the advice and try to find his own way of approaching it so I, I can quickly mention a few of my personal experience if that's uh, beneficial. For example, when I say that, uh, when I mentioned وَكُونُ مَعَ الصَّادِقِي Allah says that be with the truthful. My personal experience is to stay with the MSA, the Muslim Students Association of HKU MSA, uh, of, of HKU. And uh, honestly, I now, uh, when I was uh, as an undergraduate student, I had more Pakistani friends than Chinese friends. <laughs> uh, because the, the, this bond of faith is stronger and that really kept me strong as well and even you know uh, even putting aside the fact that I'm a Muslim I'm still a minority as a newly arrived student I'm from mainland China so in Hong Kong I'm also a minority and then that's why uh, when you have a group of people who share the same pursuit with you who share the same values with you it really makes you strong so I think uh, different people have different social circles it can be a student group, it can be a bunch of friends, it can be people from your city, people from your country, but uh, personally I think it's very beneficial to stay with a group and to always remind each other in that group. Mm -hmm.